Um, let me also introduce our two main speakers. We are here because a fantastic, amazing graphic novel has been published. And we are here because that a novel not just uh, deserves our attention, it deserves a conversation. So let me basically introduce our two conversations, our two speakers. Navid Madavian is the author of the graphic novel that we are here for. I'm not... <laughs> This is the, the, the novel, This Country Searching for Home in Very Rural America. It is an amazing book that I have taught in my class. And um, he was also very, very generous to have come and spoken to my students. Uh, you should have to buy the book. If you don't buy it now, then you can buy it a <laughs> uh, few days. I'll give you a few days. Um, so Navid has been a contributing cartoonist to the New Yorker since 2018, where his cartoons and comics appear regularly. He's author of the graphic memoir of the book I just I showed you that just came out a few days ago. Um, his work has also been featured in the LA Times, Reader's Digest, Wired, Alta Online, and in the cartoon collections, the Rejection Collection 2022, and Send Help! Exclamation mark 2021. He has received fellowships from the from the McDowell, where he was a Hershey's Family Foundation fellow, and La Napul Arts Foundation. Before becoming a, cartoonist, um, a cartoonist, he taught fifth grade, where he learned most of his jokes. <laughs> in my class, when he came to give a talk in a, a seminar, he actually did a magic trick. Um, I'm not going to ask him to do it now because of time, but he is also a, uh, a, an, a magician and illusionist. Who's, First uh, one, maybe he's called me. <laughs> now we have our second guest, Samira. Mohyeddin is an award-winning journalist and documentarian. She is going to do the, the, the biggest trick. She's going to disappear as, a, as at some point in time. So you wait for her to disappear. But she's currently a host and a producer of the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, CBC Radio, and has a Master's of Arts in Modern Middle Eastern History and Gender Studies from this very institution. And did a genocide studies at the Azorian Institute. She's also trained as a Shakespearean actor. I did not know that. And uh, is a graduate of New, um, New York's American Musical and a Dramatic Academy. So we have artists in the room, real artists, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So I'd like to um, keep my part short. I am um, Girish Daswani, because you don't know who I was. I'm an associate professor. <laughs> Anthropology, um, and along with the JHI and CDTS, which is the Center for Diaspora Transnational Studies, and with Professor Captain Roy, we'd like to um, welcome Anavi to give a short presentation, and then the conversation will begin after that. Yeah. Thank you. I was actually going to show an excerpt and read it, but I kind of feel the Shakespearean it should be the one <laughs> that's to read the excerpt. Um, so uh, as a as a by way of a first of all thank you everybody for for coming uh it means a lot this is my first time in Canada so this is the most Canadians I've been able to spend uh, time with at once um before I get to the book um by way of an introduction uh, I thought I would show a few of my New Yorker cartoons it's the reason I ended up going to Idaho I wanted to become an artist had a little cabin and um drew some cartoons and this is what I've been doing now for the past few years. Uh, so to it. Uh, they don't appear to want to take over, they just want to dance. This is the first cartoon I sold to the New Yorker. Something less wise and more bad boy. <laughs> and then the next few were rejected for good reason. Uh, you don't look like your profile picture either. <laughs> Uh, you could have told me I've been talking to your ass for the 50, past 15 minutes. And then the last one is, uh, let me just move. Move it on the way. Oh, it doesn't move? Okay, that's fine. Uh, I know I have a condom in here somewhere. The magician. The magician, exactly. Uh, so this is the house that um, my wife, Emily, and I lived in for three years. Um, it's in middle of nowhere, Idaho. Uh, we built a tiny house. Obviously, when people ask, why did we move there? The mountains, I think, speak for themselves. Um, 
And I thought rather than telling you why we went there as an introduction, I could just read you the prologue of the book, which is only a few pages, but I think does a nice job of setting the, the background, uh, the context for, for our talk today. So summer 2016, listen to this. There is much confusion between land and country. Country is the personality of land, the collective harmony of its soil, life, and weather. From all the Leopold's Sand County Almanac. In our first summer on our land, all I knew was that it was hot in July. It has to be 100 degrees. I'm literally dying. It's not that hot. We'll both be dead soon. And only Stanley will survive. He's small and can drink from the canal. I wonder which one of us he'll eat first. He's a monster. There it is. <laughs> I'm going to hop in the creek. All right, here's my butt. <laughs> <laughs> At the time, my wife Emily and I were living in the San Francisco Bay Area, but on a teacher and documentary filmmaker salaries, we have been forced to move farther and farther away from the city. Walk. Uh, Oh, I say hi, Bertie. Between teaching and traffic, I was too tired at the end of the day to draw cartoons, which is what I really wanted to do. We had visited I rural Idaho on a whim the summer before and had fallen in love with the landscape and the freedom it seemed to promise. I lived nowhere. So we bought six acres in one of its most remote areas, which was obviously the most reasonable thing to do. I think that's it. How much of it is ours? For now, it was just land, but it was our land. Where should the house go? I'm going to see how many paces it is. Is this a pace? 14, 56, 102, 300 feet wide. 25, 145, 367, 782 feet long. Walk. <laughs> What kind of bird is that? A magpie, I think. As usual, Emily knew. That will be the kitchen. The bathroom will be there. There'll be a loft up there where we can sleep. And a couch facing two big glass doors so you can see the mountains. Our garden can go there. Where do you think the neighbors will put the burning cross? <laughs> I can finally tell someone to get off my property. Who's yeah. the ridiculous Stanley Na Navid is? Yes, he is. Trump had just secured the Republican nomination for president. What a joke. I mean, he can't win, right? We were in search of adventure, a place we could own land and start a family. The millennial dream. We would decide to leave three years later, but for now, we had found our new home. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, so the first question I want to ask you is why? Why Idaho? Because I, I it, in the book, you do say that you visited before. Yeah. So what was it about the landscape? And like you showed that one picture of the mountains, but why why Idaho? Uh we had visited, it was on a whim. We were looking on Airbnb, went over Idaho. Neither of us had been to Idaho. We didn't know anything about Idaho. So we visited. Um and I mean it was beautiful. We got to go to the rodeo. It was we sort of got the full Idaho experience. And initially it was just going to be a place to go for the summer. Um, but then decided that she wanted to be a filmmaker, I wanted to be an artist. We couldn't own any, anything in the Bay Area, and so it just felt like the right thing. And you're 20 miles, was it 20 miles away? Yeah, the nearest town was 500 people, uh, 20 miles outside. We were 20 miles outside of town, um, so very remote. Yeah, and then, then your closest neighbor was? About a mile and a half away at first. Okay, So and yeah. so the, are these, these are the neighbors that pop by and they start guessing your name or where yeah. you're from? Yeah. So in, in the book, they're like, you are you Lebanese? Are you this and that? And then she finally said, you say, I'm, I'm Iranian. And her response is, that's okay. 
<laughs> and I've often wondered, like, what would not have been the okay answer? Yeah. So that, at that point, was that the point where you were like, okay, where have I come to? Yeah, I mean, I think it was a nice intro because we're sitting there and our neighbors just come on and they have wine, which is which is great. And immediately asked, where's my name from? Which in many contexts can be fine. And that context felt like pointed question. And then immediately launched into how ISIS was here, oh. which again, I thought is a test. You know, and I nodded my head and I said, sure, ISIS is here. Um, but I, 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 I think that was probably what we had expected. Um, I don't think we expected it to be like so immediate. Yeah. Uh, but these were the progressives too. No, these were not the oh, progressives. Not no, the no, progressives. no, no, no. But, but Jim and Angie, they did end up becoming, because they were our neighbors, they did end up becoming um, some of our closest friends for that first year. Mm -hmm. And there's this sort of, in, throughout the book, you're like, there's the bald eagles. There's like a real knowledge. This is one of the things that really surprised me. People knew what the birds were. And then you're, there's sort of these Greek and Roman um, phrases and characters from like mythological characters interspersed throughout. Why? Uh, I mean, to your point, the people there, I mean, when thinking about the character of Navi, yeah. um, I had to... It's an interesting process. I don't know how many of you have uh, written something like this, but thinking about yourself like a, a character, you have to think about the arc. And so I had to think about like, who is Navi? Um, and so I chose the bumbling idiot because I mean, I am sort of a bumbling idiot, but for the, the sake of the, the book in particular to show that growth, we did go in there not knowing very much about the place. Um, and you can see, as you said, that the people who live there, they do know the land, they do know the animals. They've been there for many of them for 150 years. So we were very much the outsiders coming, mm -hmm. coming in and learning about the place and oftentimes from them. Uh, but then having come from a city, having studied classics, I tried to intersperse what I understood what I was bringing to the place of my experience. And oftentimes that was, you know, Greek and Roman mythology, mm -hmm. it, Persian literature, uh, things like that, that helped me to process a lot of what I was experiencing while learning about the land, learning about the animals and learning from the people there. When I was reading it, I was trying to sort of picture you navigating not just the landscape, but these characters that were coming into your life. Did you ever at some point feel that you had to make yourself small or that you couldn't be your full self? Like, I'm sure you weren't talking to Jed about Roman mythology. No, yeah. I mean, there, we did have some interesting conversations where I was trying to convince him that evolution was real. <laughs> um, his response was, well, that makes sense. My, I think it was something like, I have some family members who feel, who seem like monkeys. So I think that was always like, maybe there was some uh, movement there. Um, Yes, I, I think there were certain topics that I understood were things that we don't talk about. Emily was much more open about talking about politics. Uh -huh. um, and it maybe she's a white American. And so it may have been that there was just a level of comfort. She just may have been more comfortable having those conversations. But I did feel like I couldn't broach certain things, um, if only because I had developed these very tenuous relationships. and. I feel like Trump had this way of bringing out the worst in people. And I knew that if certain things would, topics would be broached, maybe there would just be that rift both ways that wouldn't then be able to be uh, bridged. And then other times, I think things would just come up in conversation where I felt like I would have to be small. I grew up in Miami and then moved to the Bay Area and I never had the experience of being a minority. My parents are from Iran, but those places are very diverse. Idaho, particularly rural Idaho was very very white I was one of two brown people in the uh in the town um and so there were occasions where people would say things would use really nasty language racist you know words or would ask me these pointed questions like there's a scene where I'm having a very pleasant conversation with an older woman in the cafe slash bait slash tackle slash hunting okay. shop yeah <laughs> and we have this nice conversation and she ends it she's like can I ask you a question I said sure and she says you're not a Muslim are you and it's one of those experiences where it's like I did shrink I wish I could have responded in a way that would have been true to who I am would have honored my family and my parents and their culture and I just shrunk and I got scared and I didn't know how to respond and it's this very this moment of shame that I've had to um, 
And I think for, when I'm lying in bed, I like sometimes to go to sleep, I think about like what I would have said to Ruth. Um, but that was a really interesting part in the book because you called your mom. Yeah. So he calls his mom. I'm not gonna, gonna read the book anyways, but call your mom and you say, why are you, why are you dyeing your hair? <laughs> You know, like it was it, very interesting how you sort of pushed back on her and her. Yeah. Maybe you're thinking your mom's trying to assimilate. She's like, because I look better with this. Yeah. Yeah. There, I, I think being there was the first time where I had to. I, I saw myself the way that other people might see me. Like I, I had to think like, well, I do have features that. Uh, people could read as being vaguely Middle Eastern. Mm -hmm. um, and so this was the, the the first way that many people in the town would, would first perceive me. And so in that section, I think about the first time I saw a picture of my mother with dark hair when she was like 17. And I, I have that same experience where it's like this experience of foreignness, where I'm seeing my mother, not as my mother, but as this like Iranian. And I realize it's because I've never seen her with black hair okay, yeah okay. she's just my entire life she's dyed it so she says it's because she looks better but i there might blonde. be something there's blonde I, I joke that there's this one unfortunate <laughs> woman in the 80s where she dies a blonde okay so but usually it's like brown yeah very shades of brown um there was a beautiful line and i i to be honest i don't know if this was you or you were quoting someone because there are there are very select few quotes in, in the book but you wrote that we easily forget that we are track makers though because most of our journeys now occur on asphalt and concrete, and these are substances not easily pressed. And it just really reminded me of Henry David Thoreau. Mm -hmm. Like I was thinking a lot about him, Walden, and like why I, why I went to the woods. Um, but did you ever feel like, were you, did you ever sort of channel Thoreau? Were you like, this is, I was so yeah, to I mean, the woods? I, when I was, thinking about why am I here I'd have yeah. to be like because it's romantic like yeah. like throw yeah that quote actually comes from Robert McFarland who's oh. one of the uh one of my favorite he's like a travel writer and naturalist and uh that comes from the section on tracks right we're stuck in it's winter super cold our cars aren't starting and so I get to explore the land and that the country is new to us but it's not new to the people and the animals who live there and so I follow the tracks um and the quote resonated with me because coming from the city, like you go from point A to point B, but there's this way that when you're in a place like that, where you just have hundreds of acres to just wander, where you do, like there isn't a point A and a point B, mm -hmm. you're just meandering and you get to see these other animals who also in the winter time are meandering probably old and looking for food. And yeah. I'm just like leisurely yeah, walking around. Um, but that that did that did stick with me. And then I also think that there's something very like wonderfully meta about like that section getting to draw tracks. And I think that writing a graphic novel and drawing it is in its own form a way of imprinting and making tracks on the page and getting to preserve that experience. Those tracks that I don't get to see now that I'm back in the city for uh, myself and people who are reading it after. Let's talk a little bit about your your style of cartooning. Um, it's very minimalist, very sparse. I mean, it, it sort of makes you do a lot of the work, like your imagination. Why did you sort of choose that style? Was it on purpose? Yeah, it's well, it's funny because it's been described as like minimalist, but there are some times where I'm like, this drawing is too like, much. Too, exactly. It's like, I, I don't know how I'm going to finish this. Uh, I think in part it was as a way to like reflect the experience, like the, 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 the seasons when it's like mm -hmm. cold and it's snowy, you, you can't, you know, there's just a few lines show like the tracks and the grass that's poking through in the shadows. Um, but then also, I mean, like I'm not a trained artist, I studied education. And so a lot of what I've been doing over the past few years, I've been figuring out like how to cartoon first and then, I jumped into the graphic novel and so I feel like I got my 10,000 hours while while drawing the book and so when you look at it at the beginning and at the end I think the drawings at the end are a little bit better than at the beginning because there's just that time to practice and so I think in part it was um an aesthetic choice to reflect the sort of just being out there in the middle of nowhere and then also it was a practical choice because drawing like animals in the landscape is really hard so <laughs> Um, you also celebrate the first day of spring while you're out yeah. there. You do like, you know, the Persian jumping over the fire and stuff like that. And it, it, at the same time, you're planting the indigenous, like three sisters, just, I think here we call it three sisters soup. There too, probably squash and, and that stuff. And it, it was really lovely the way 
you and Emily were interacting with the land. Is that something that you sort of envisioned before you got out there that you knew that this is how I'm going to interact with the land? Yeah, I mean, definitely what we envisioned did not match up with what ended up happening, which I think is one of the themes of the of the book. Um, she's always been into gardening. I haven't been, but being there and having that much land, I think our idea was we're going to like be like never farmers, but like subsistence, subsistence gardeners yeah, would live off uh, the land, live off the yeah. land um, which... I don't know how many of you have been trying to those really, really freaking hard. Um, particularly in that climate, the winters would get down to like negative, you know, 37. Uh, it snows every month of the year except for August. So the first time I planted my squash, that first summer, it was June. I think it was like, you know, June 8th planted them and then I woke up the next day and there was like three inches of snow and so I was like okay you know like that didn't work out this time um so there was just this steep learning curve to doing that and I think by our third year we, we, you know, we had 23 raised beds some of which were like five feet by 20 feet uh, a cold frame and we had figured out how to grow just like a wide range of uh, of things um but we, we never got to the point where we were able just to just yeah, because it's also really like exhausting and takes all of your time. And there's other things I want to be doing yeah. than just, you know, watering my plants and weeding. So, uh, and there was a lot of that happening too. There was a lot of that. Happening, um, yeah. One of the major themes in the book is this sense of home and belonging and sort of searching for home. And I, I find that a lot of Iranians do this. Like I was recently in Buenos Aires and I was walking on the street and I was like, oh, it looks just like, you know, Khyabuna, what is it called? Balias yeah, yeah. or whatever. And my partner was like, God, every time we go somewhere, like, <laughs> it's like you're not there. You're always looking for yeah. you know, someone. Do you find yourself doing that? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, the last time I was in Iran was 28 years ago. So my memories of it are from the perspective yeah. of a 10 year old. Um, so I can't compare it to that, but I know my, my wife, she, although she's a white American, she also speaks Farsi and she has, oh, she does yeah, and she went to Tajikistan and made a film there and she's familiar with like Central Asia. And for yeah. her, the mountains, she talked about how we're reminiscent of the mountains yeah. there in Afghanistan. Um, so she had that connection to it. And we'd also see, interestingly enough, fighter jets flying over because the military would also, they had a base there and they would train because it's so similar to yeah. Central Asia. Um, but I, I, I think more so for me, and it was a new place. I, I didn't have a lot of comparisons to make, but I mm -hmm. think for the most part, I was comparing it to the image in my head that I had of going to this place. And sometimes it matched up and sometimes I uh, didn't. And what about your parents? Did they ever come out there? Did they see the space? They, they yeah, yeah, they, they came out there. They were, um, I think I blocked out my mom's prote protest protestations before I moved out because she was worried about me going out there. And when she visited, I think her experience for the most part was good. Everyone was very welcoming, but I think it's hard to shake off your expectations and people do stare, but it's hard to know, like, is it because of the complexion of my skin? Mm -hmm. I mean, when they ask me like, you're not a Muslim, it's definitely because of the complexion of your skin, but people do stare and it's, is it because of that or just because you're new to the town and there's only 500 people. So my mom visited or my dad visited, he's like, you're somebody new to the town and we're going to just like leave her a little bit too long and make you uncomfortable. Um, but they visited and I think that it was, it was nice getting to show them like what we were trying to build and mm -hmm. trying to convince them this, this is why we're here. But I don't think they were ever convinced. No. Yeah. Um, and, and you, as you were writing the book, uh, what did you sort of learn about home and belonging and, and what, what all that means? Yeah, I, uh, so initially the, um, the, when I first conceived of the writing writing a book, uh, it's like it seems like the natural next, next step. You draw single panel cartoons, and it's like, what if I stick a bunch of them together? Then I get a story. Um, initially, it was going to be about my parents moving from Iran. They moved uh, uh, during the revolution. They didn't know the revolution was happening. They didn't know. They, my mom thought I'll go back for my birthday, and then she eventually was able to return ten years later for the first after time. After the war. After, after yeah, the war. yeah, and so. Initially, I was like, I'm going to write that story. Um, but then when I spoke to my friend about it, she said, well, where are you? And that people are going to wonder where you are. And so I started focusing on myself and then I got rid of my parents uh, and just focused on myself. <laughs> um, uh, they're both funny enough, both wanted the book dedicated to them. So not in the book and the book's not dedicated to them, but they do have an acknowledgement. They do appear in the book. Um, but I, I, I think 
even though the story was not about their story of, of migration and exile, uh, it did make me in many ways appreciate their experience, although it's not you know, my moving to Idaho because I want to have this romantic image of being a farmer. It's very different than being uh, a person in exile from your homeland. Um, it did make me appreciate more of this, what that must have felt like in some way. And they moved to Oklahoma at first when they first yeah. came over and they were there for a year. But that feeling of not fitting in, of trying to stake a place for yourself, um, and it also helped me to explore a little bit about like what it meant to be an Iranian American. And over the course of the book, I talk more and more about that. And so in some ways it made me connect to my parents and their experience and to this identity that I hadn't really explored because I, I think for a lot of second generation uh, immigrants, you're just trying to be an American or a Canadian. And what happens at home is the weird stuff that your parents try to get you to do, going to the Farsi classes or um, eating, you know, sheep's brain. Um, and so you try to just like run away from that. But I think being there and then spoiler alert, eventually having a kid also helps you to think about, well, you know, who I, who am I, where do I come from and what am I going to pass on and leave behind? Uh, how important are your surroundings? I mean, after because you said that the, the cabin is two hundred and eighty square feet, yeah. right? So you guys must really love each other. Yeah, I think that was, <laughs> uh, we definitely it was. We were doing the pandemic living together before the before pandemic living thing. Pandemic. Yeah, but how important um, when you're out there? This land is so vast. Yeah. How important are your surroundings to you? Because I know some people are like, it doesn't matter to me where yeah. I am. You know, matters who I'm with. Yeah. But how important are your surroundings to you? Um, I mean, I think they're important. And I think being out there, uh, I think they became more important. One of the things that I explore in the book is like what I mentioned at the beginning, the personality of the land. And part of the personality of the land is the people. But what I realized in the book is that the place is not just the people, right? It is the people who were there and were displaced. It's the animals, the, the flora, the landscapes. And so a lot of the book is just me, the house and the land apart from the, the, the people who inhabit the place. And so there are long uh, segments, extended segments where there is no talking, there's no dialogue, no narration. It's just me in nature, the things that I'm observing, I'm experiencing quiet moments in the house with, uh, with Emily. And so I think there's just something about being in a place like that, that makes the place the experience of it sort of at the, the forefront. This might sound a little bit weird, but while reading the book, I was also thinking about Stanley. Yeah. Um, which was the dog, their dog. The monster. Did you see, did, did Stanley, did you see Stanley change? I mean, this must have been weird for Stanley. Yeah, I, mean, right? I feel most, sudden... I feel most bad for having now moved back to a city for Stanley because he yeah. had just like his kingdom and now he has a tiny, you know, apartment. <laughs> um, but he, it was really annoying where he would just disappear and then you hear barking, he's chasing deer, he's chasing cows. Uh, there was one night, Emily, it's the first time she's left, I'm by myself in the cab and there's a part in the book where I talk about where we had this shock and I well, yeah, keep it there. The yeah, in case, you know, for white supremacists. And then like, I let Stanley out and as soon as I let him out, it's like a movie, like a fog descends and I can't see him and he just runs off and I'm like chasing him, listening to the small pitter patter of his feet. And then I finally, after like 10 minutes, like see something these like blue eyes glowing in the dark and I called Emily and I'm like I think it's like a wolf and she's like how high off the ground is yeah. it? And I'm like it's pretty low and she's like it's probably Stanley and, <laughs> and it was Stanley so I think that he um there definitely was this like exploration that he also got to do mm -hmm. winter time the first three days we were there his first time in the snow he literally went three days without pooping or peeing because the snow is deep and I remember googling yeah. I remember googling and there was like uh, like I think it was like a Reddit form where people were like my dog's like refusing to poop and pee and it actually was he's a Chihuahua Jack Russell it was a Chihuahua Jack Russell who was refusing to poop and pee and eventually he because it was right against his butt it was right against his butt yeah yeah and he'd get in there uh, so I had to like clear things up <laughs> so it was a learning experience for everybody um let's talk guns sure because guns guns uh take up good chunk of the of the book and yeah. your relationship to guns you developed sure. a sort of new outlook on guns yeah uh, talk, talk to me about that while you're out there. What did you learn about people and their guns? Yeah, I, I think like a lot of people who grew up in cities, guns mean, uh, you know, domestic violence, 
gang violence, uh, homicide. Um, and so going out there, I think I, uh, that's my conception of guns that I had. But as I said, we actually had a shotgun that my wife Emily inherited from her father, uh, who had never been used and it became this novelty item. So when people came out, we're like, it's like, it's uh, let's go like shoot the shotgun and we'd shoot the shotgun. Um, and uh, just probably not the safest thing to do. It probably flies in the face of gun safety. Um, but, but being there and being around people who uh, guns are a way of life for, for better or worse, and I did get to see some of that that better, it complicated my understanding of the, the gun debate because um, people out there, often it was subsistence, right? Mm -hmm. You would pay $5 for a hunting tag and then you'd shoot an elk or a deer or a moose or something. And that was your family's food for a month, two months, three months. And some of the people who I, I became friends with, they would talk about how when they were kids, it's a very poor area. Most people are ranchers and farmers. Um, as, as kids, if you didn't hunt, well, then you didn't eat. And so I never thought about the gun debate from this like class an economics perspective. And it does also make, and I talk about this in the book, that it does make, in some sense, even like an ecological sense, right? Where you have this very, the county is the size of Connecticut, but it's all, which I guess we're in Canada, it's, uh, look, it's, it's the size of the state, but it only has 4,500 people. And so it's very remote. And so you can either use your local resources, which is the animals, mm -hmm. or you can truck things in. Uh, into the grocery store. So it also made an environmental sense to, to hunt. And I was a vegetarian, which is also like, you don't tell people you're, you're a vegetarian. So that was a secret I would, I kept with myself almost until the end. Um, but, uh, but I, I find it like, I understood why hunting could be uh, uh, so important and why guns could, could mean that for, for the people there. But then also I would meet people who had, there's a character in the book, Don, who has showed me a uh, hundred of his guns, which is a quarter of his total guns. Uh, he's one of the scarier characters I meet in the in the book, who also says some not very nice things. Uh, but there were those people who really did like cling to their 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 guns because they thought the government was coming coming for them. They were coming to take their guns. One of the people who I befriended out there was a eighty year old or so man. He said, "I have my guns in case the government comes for me." And I'm like, "You're like eighty five years old. I don't know. Like, what? I don't know if there's anything you could do if the government comes for you." Um, but that mentality of a militia, like that. totally, and 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 the, and those were there. There were like the feet of the "Don't Tread on Me" signs. As we were leaving, there were the you'd see off in the woods the three percenters, which in America the three percenters it's a paramilitary group because they they believe that erroneously that only three percent of Americans fought in the American Revolution. They're the three percent that are gonna fight once the you know the Civil War starts, and you'd see their flags waving. And so there was also then that other. The, the sort of the, the darker side of the, the, the gun debate and what I would usually think think about it. And so there was that uneasy uneasiness um, because it also is open carry. And so it was the first time I did see people like having, you know, but then again, like I would go out, our, our friend uh, Kevin was showing us out, showing us around because my wife was making a film there and he had a gun on his, you know, he had his cowboy hat, uh, his, you know, his socks hiked up in his cowboy cowboy boots and he had a gun on his, on it, in a holster on his side. And it was the first time I'd seen that, but he also said the last time he was out there, there were some like wolves and he had dogs. He's a rancher and that's why he could bring it out. And it's like, that makes sense. But there still was that uneasiness. Mm -hmm. So I think there was con that constant negotiation between uh, a growing familiarity and understanding and then also the scary or paramilitary governments coming for us side of, of being there. There was also this great part in the book where you come come across cinema, yeah. sort of cinema that's shut down and you guys are gonna revivify it, bring it back to life, but it doesn't quite quite work out. You know, so there, and you find, oh, I have to show John Wayne movies for these people to give a shit. And then so you, and then you put it aside. What was that experience? Yeah, so like? that's one of the more comedic elements yeah. So you have like the gun stuff and then you have like, the guys come in and they're like, we're gonna make an art house theater in the middle of nowhere, Idaho. Shocker, it doesn't work out. Um, it's called Clean, right? Clean. No, Clean's one of the nearby towns. Okay. So the town is called Mackey, it's unnamed in the, in, in the book. Um, but the the Mackey main, it was like this filming device, there's nothing to do in town. And so, it, you know, this beautiful art deco marquee um, and we would, you know, pass by it and then there was one day where Emily, she kind of lingered out her, you know, eyes cupped around the window and she's, uh, 
scanning the, the it's like this old soda shop interior and I joke that if there's like an x-axis and a y-axis the x-axis is how long is Emily quiet and the y-axis y -axis how much trouble are we going to be in this would have been off the charts and I knew we were going to be reopening the movie theater um, and so we did and uh, we had help from the community everybody was very excited about it. it had been closed for like 10 years but in many ways I think this is we felt like this is what we could give back to the community you know we can and then it's again like very naive or like you know arts and movies and we're going to be able to do this for them um and i think in some ways it, it was romantic but then also uh very unfair because like we were going to show our art house movies and then we were shocked when nobody came to see the <laughs> yeah exactly but the foreign documentary that's subtitled about whale hunting in the faroe islands which i thought was great but then shock for people that it's not really what they wanted to do with their their weekends which is like fair enough and movie theaters are just a hard sell anywhere because of streaming services yeah. and you only have 500 people um but people would often ask for john wayne and we were resistant and we eventually did and people came out um and but but then there also was and i'm a big fan of john wayne and john ford um but there was also then something very uh different that, that felt different about seeing uh, we show The Quiet Man, about seeing that film in the context of Mackie. Uh, it's a film I've seen a bunch and I, and I enjoy, but, you know, seeing, the, you know, John Wayne, like, dragging Maureen O'Hara and shoving her and some of, like, the jokes that they make, it just felt different in the context of, like, Cowboy Hats, this community that itself felt stuck in the 1950s and that envisioned this, this sort of like make America great again, this yeah. vision of this idealized past that masks misogyny and very conservative values. And so I feel like that's one of those areas where it just felt like maybe there is that cultural gap and there's nothing wrong with liking those movies. And again, I do like them, um, but it just felt like maybe there is this gap that we can't, this place where we can't meet. Mm -hmm. It's difficult, it's interesting because it's quite difficult to come together. I mean, I, that scene where you're, you are in a room, I forget where you were exactly, and the gentleman, Don, I think it is, who Don, has all the guns, and he uses the N-word very yeah. flippantly, and on the page, you just see you getting smaller and smaller yeah. and smaller, and that's all I kept thinking about was when you being there and having to sort of, you know, do you, did you feel like you could be your full Navi? Yeah, I mean, in those situations, I definitely couldn't. I talk about it and that seemed like I received into nothingness. Um, and there also is that element of recognizing that I'm a minority, but I'm also physically smaller. You know, there are these towering, I mean, I'm not, you know, most like robust figure, um, but I'm, I'm smaller than them. And they're using language that I realized like I haven't heard and he makes when makes a joke about how Trump had done more for the economy in eight yeah. months than that rag had did in you know referencing Obama in eight years and it's just like you can see me right like but and I, and, I, and I don't know fully what was going on but there was that cognitive dissonance where afterwards he's like well you know come on back whenever you're in town like my door's yeah. open to you and so just like that push and pull of you know being pushed away by those things but then them pulling you back in and not fully understanding um how they're able to uh make sense of how they're treating me and then their like world views which are very hostile to people who but they're who so like friendly me. too at times they are and that's what's yeah. so jarring you know I, I just interject we we have our own little we have people like that here too uh like we, i so bought a we're out there yes i bought a place yeah. in the county yeah. in the country which everyone i'm sure has heard of the county already which everyone thinks it's so nice out there where but if you go deep into the county, yeah. we have Trump flags. Like my neighbor has a Trump flag and says he will rise again. So as you're driving by, you're like, well, you know, but like two streets over, they're having cappuccinos. You have no idea. Yeah. You know? And there was a huge, like we had a big anti-vax population here of people who, and again, it says, you know, unvaccinated welcome on some of the storefronts. So we have that here too. Yeah. And, it's, and it is jarring because they're so friendly. And my partner and I, like, what are they thinking? Like, we're sisters or like, you know, what's going on here? Yeah. But I, I honestly don't think that they are thinking about those things as they yeah, look I think, at you. Yeah, I think that that was one of my, my, my takeaways was that on a personal level, 
I think people are often, and there were people who were not friendly, but for mm-hmm. the most part, even if you would say things that I was shocked by, they were friendly. And I think it's because on an individual level, you can treat somebody one way, but then you can have these worldviews and often like these ideas that are coming from outside the town themselves from like Fox News. They'd be like concerned about the border and it's like you're 2000 miles from the border. Like, why is this an issue for you? Um, but there were these just pernicious ideas that would then didn't really matter. And like, even like the, the, the city commissioner, or I think this commissioner was like this Democrat, this old school, very like pro-union, you know, mm-hmm. suspenders Democrat. And the idea a place that voted 90% for Trump would have a Democrat as the person who was one of the head people running the town was a shocker, but it wasn't when you think about things at the local level, Mm -hmm. right? They just, they're concerned with like, am I going to have my water tomorrow? Like, right, that's what they're concerned about. And all of these other things are the noise that exists in the background, which then just like, it rears its ugly head occasionally, which then makes me want to retreat. But also like just being a small town, like you depend on one another, you know? And I feel like there's that small town ethos that I was dependent on, that Emily and I were dependent on, and the people there are dependent on where you can just see a person as an individual. But I, but then I also do, I did wonder like if I were an African-American, if I did have an accent, if Emily were not white, mm-hmm. would my experience of the place have been different? And I would hear stories about people coming in, being driven out at gunpoint. So I think maybe I did what have this privilege of being able to sort of like pass. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of Persian elements in here too. It's not just Greek and, and Roman, and I, I think it was on page, 94, you cited probably one of the most famous poems by Fulah Hafad al Yeah. And, and this is just as your, I think it was your planting. Yeah. And Emily was getting pregnant. Yeah, I, the, 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 well, it's foreshadowing the, the, yes, the pregnancy that's coming. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. what came into my mind. And it's, that this, for those who don't know, the line is, uh, it's from the poem Another Birth by Fulah Hafad al And you wrote, as, as you and Emily, I will plant my hands in the garden. I will grow. I know, I know. And doves will lay eggs in, in the hollow of my egg state hand. Yeah. Why did you want to include uh, That poem's actually important. It's my mom actually uh, helped me with the, the translation, it's mostly yeah. her, her translation. Um, but I remember that poem uh, being one of the only like Persian poems that she had read to me. And it was me very meaningful to her as a, a kid when she was in poetry. Um, and so I knew that I wanted to include something like that, but that comes right after that scene with Jim and John, where they're saying the really horrible things. And I, we're talking about how I've never heard the N word before. And then the, you know, his truck drives by in the distance as we're working in the garden. and it felt like this moment where like there is there are those people there but the place is not the people we're trying to build this life here that's both like gardening a family artistic and so like just like digging your hands into the soil into the dirt to try to make something grow that's separate from drowning those other things exactly yeah sorry i've lost my track of that and so there's also you with the animals there's yeah. a lot of them. You guys know Emily knows all the birds. Yep. I don't know how. Well, she knew that bird. But how? Look at that. Uh, she's just again. If I'm the bumbling idiot, she's the one who knows what's going on. And for the most part, that would that is our dynamic. Where I'm, I ask her questions, she knows uh, what's going on. Um, but she, people in small towns, I say this, they they always know who you are. But then I had this experience where Emily also knew who they were because she would do her research, and so I think she was just more prepared. Um, for, for the place. Yeah. Um, but I think it was also a process of learning the land. Um, Robert, Did you? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, because I was going to say Robert McFarland, he has this beautiful book called Lost Words, uh, the, the impetus of which was um, seeing that the Oxford English Dictionary was getting, for, for kids, was getting rid of some words like acorn and other words that were had to do with like nature and replacing them with like email and things like that, which are important. But he was like, what a loss if we lose these words, because if you don't have a word for it, then you don't see it, right? It actually does not exist for you. And over the course of being there for three years, there was this incredible experience of just having like a category of bird, but then learning the birds and they got into bird watching before it was cool. Um, but getting to learn and then getting to see the birds, right? Rather than just being bird, knowing that that's a Western meadowlark or, you know, a, a black-billed magpie or um, a, 
so whatever they were, mm -hmm. but being able to then also track the seasons by it and seeing that there's just a bird that is literally there for a day oh, as it's time. leaving. Yeah. And so the experience of the place just being so much more enriched when you can, when you have a word for it. And in the book he talks about, there's like words in like Scotland for like a wind that starts high and comes low and then goes back up or a one that starts low. And just like, what a different experience of the place if you can see the like the place for, for all of the, the the, the things that are there and so I think there was that process of trying to, to learn the place um to, to to really get to know the the personality but you it. do eventually leave and it, yeah. it's it's very interesting because she Emily has your daughter yeah. Alika and there was this point in the book where you were like okay you know this was good for us but you're trying to envision your daughter growing mm -hmm. up there and so what was it exactly you were like we gotta go uh I yeah I think that um when we went we had thought we could start a family here but over the course of being there I think it was that uh cultural gap and what and I really tried being sensitive to the place like I know some people who have just read the book mm -hmm. who live there and have said thankfully positive things about it um but this is their as a quick aside to show that this is like their home one of the women who she's an older woman who ordered the book and I was very nervous for her to read it, but she was always very welcoming, very kind. She pops up in the book where she gives me a cup of coffee as a thank you for the theater. But she said that she got teary eyed because there's an image that I used of these cowboys. Um, and I had a reference photo that I found online from National Geographic of the area, three cowboys. And she's like, that's my dad, my granddad and my uncle. And she said, I still have that. My mom still has the, the, the actual, magazine, the actual yeah. photo. And she said, I got teary eyed when I saw it. And she's like, thank you. And I think it was important for me as I was writing the book to recognize that like I was there for three years, which I feel like gave me some insider perspective. It was my home for a little while, but I was just coming in and leaving. And this is the, like, this is their, their home. Um, and so I tried to be respectful and sympathetic and kind while also still. That still really comes game. across though. Yeah, which is, yeah. which was what, what I was hoping. Um, because I think at the end of the day, there were things that I thought were worthy of critique, but then it also was just like a difference in culture. And I wonder in a segment of the book, like when my parents moved here and they moved to Oklahoma, like if I had been in Oklahoma, like would I have been wearing chaps? Yeah. Uh, which by the way, all are all, all of them are assless, which I learned over the proper course chaps. of yeah. proper yeah. chaps are. Um, but I wondered like, what would my life have, have been like had I grown up there? And I probably would have had similar values, would have done similar things. And so that was an important realization that we're leaving not because there's something that is like inherently wrong about this place, but it's just not for me, you know? And th there's one striking, uh, there's a moment in the book that was uh, for me, one of the more striking things to, to illustrate, it's seeing these like pile of coyotes uh, and seeing them on the back of the pickup truck. And my friends tell me afterwards that it's a coyote, it's called a predator derby where you go out and the winners yeah, whoever can right. shoot as many coyotes and wolves when that's legal as possible. And it's like in those moments where I'm like, I don't know if this is the place for me. And like, that's great for them, but like, I don't want to be shooting coyotes. And, yeah. and they were doing it out of necessity. Like they, they had to. Right? Out of necessity. I mean, I think like my, my friend uh, who I was talking to about it, I think there's always that like, uh, gap uh, where like they'll argue it's out of necessity and then the environmentalists will say well you're actually doing more harm like with coyotes they often will shoot the alphas which then causes disruptions in the uh, the, the family the systems plan, yeah. which then so like it's just it's 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 complicated as anything is um, but they had their arguments the environmentalists had their arguments and um, what do I know but I just knew it wasn't for me so um I want to I don't have much time so I want to open it up to the floor is that okay chair does anyone have a question for Navi? I have a curiosity question for you how did you get to page 94 because there's no page numbers here <laughs> oh you don't have page numbers so I I didn't actually I didn't have this version I didn't have a book version I got the pdf which I, which is really great because I was, I was able to scroll down a screen and at times people were like moving, Yeah, which was really cool. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I want to say it was an artistic choice, but I don't know why my publisher did that. So I, I only realized after I saw the book that there were no page numbers. So, sorry. That's real strong. Yeah, <laughs> to read the book in, in order to get to it. Are there any other questions?
Oh, hi. Uh, thank you for that. Um, I had a question. I'm an artist, so um, your work is it doesn't have any color, but then I noticed like your cover has like a very striking use of color. And I was wondering like what was the thought process behind choosing color here versus no color, especially because your story is so much involved with the nature. Yeah, there there was a moment where I had thought about like being able to like using color to match the seasons. There's a book called Arab of the Future. Uh, it's a great graphic novel about um I forgot the author's name, but he lived in uh, Libya when he was a kid. Um, and the the time is tracked by the color. So there's like blue and red. And I thought about doing that. But then there is the it always comes back to the practicality. Um, the cost of printing color is more. And so I would have had to cut like pages. And then two, I also don't know how to use color. So that was like a, a easier because it just I, I wouldn't have known how to do it. But then the cover having color to help make it pop. And also on the cover, it's yellow for the rural area, blue for San Francisco. So just the contrast between city and rural. Yeah. Uh, I think you, you were saying you're self-taught for both the cartooning and then making the transition to graphic novel in going from the sort of telling your story entirely within a single panel, single image to the multi-image, multi-panel storytelling. Is there a, what uh, any specific works that you turn to for influence or like ones that you learn from particularly to uh, inform your own work? Yeah, I mean, they're like the classics, like Persepolis um, by Matt John Satrapi. It's, if, you, if you haven't read it, it's probably the greatest graphic novel ever written. Um, it's about her experience of with the Iranian revolution around leaving. Uh, so that was a constant reference. Um, and then just like, I, 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 I'm thankfully I have lots of friends who are cartoonists and graphic novelists. So I leaned on like their work, like Julia Wirtz is somebody who I turn to. I, I think that one of the things I wanted to do while writing the book is using humor to tell the story. So even in like the sort of harrowing moments in the book, I try to fuse it with it. And people like Julia Wirtz are so good at like telling jokes. Um, you're very good at telling jokes too. Yeah. <laughs> There's some really funny bits that you're, when you look at the book and you're like, I shouldn't be laughing here yeah. right now. But I am. Yeah, and I think you need that. And I, and I think part of, um, as a quick aside, um, I think that was a conscious choice in like particularly like the movie theater, those sections where I don't want to be too harsh, where I am critiquing the place, being able to be self-deprecating, making jokes like at my own expense, I think it's helpful. I think it helps to do that when you're critiquing a place. So yeah, I think it was uh, Julia Wirtz, Marajan, and then yeah, and there's like a whole genre of like migration, those books that I, I leaked on. So what's next? <laughs> um, good question. I've been doing a lot of I've been doing a lot of comics for the New Yorker, um, which has been nice because I did single panels an entire book, and I'm doing shorter comics um, for the New Yorker and the LA Times. And uh, as a new father, obviously that's like what you think about. I was a primary caretaker for for my daughter uh, until she started school. So a lot of my work has been revolved around that, but then also about being an Iranian American, particularly since the revolution that's happening there right now, I think it's come to the forefront of a lot of people's in the diaspora, their minds. So I've been- No longer on the periphery. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Um, so I've been doing some work around that and I, the, the, the new book proposal that I'm working on, which my friends have joked, this is this country to be that country. Um, it has to do with, um, yeah, being a father and an Iranian American and exploring more uh, that, that element. I, I said I was finished, but I do have one sure. question. Why cartoons? Like, you're not, you didn't study this, mm -hmm. right? What is it about that medium? Because even Madjana Satyarpi, when she talks about Persepolis, says, this was the only medium that I could actually tell this story. Yeah. You know, if, if she made an actual film about that, we're not ready yet. That's what mm -hmm. she was saying. We're not ready to explore these things. What is it about that medium that you love so much? Yeah, I, mean, I was joking, I think, in one of the classes yesterday. But I was at that, I mean, every artist will say their art form is the highest art form. And it's like a hill I'll die on that cartooning is the highest art form. Because you could just tell a story, often a very silly story, in just a single panel, a uh, few lines, maybe a caption. Um, but I think that there's something about the graphic novel, the comic book, that lends itself to the memoir. You know, it, it's not everybody who gets to actually, like, 
visually represent themselves, right? You have the avatar, you have the Navi character who's guiding you through the story. And there's just this way that the process of, of drawing myself, of putting myself into those scenes helps to um, tell the story in a way that is very unique that I think you couldn't do with prose or, you know, with any of the other mediums. Yeah, it was very, I read it twice. The first time you can sit and read it in one sitting. Yeah. And then the second time I went back and I was like, oh, this is funny. Because the first time you're trying to get to know the characters, yeah. you appreciate it a lot more. I can draw my face really well yeah. now. <laughs> <laughs> Beard helps. <laughs> if thank, if, are there any other questions from the audience? Well, Samira, if you yeah. have to go, I could just stay with, yeah, yeah. with the Q&A for a bit. Sure. I want, to, I want to ask you to, to join me in thanking Samira um, for how you get I, we have a few, few more minutes, and I do. I know maybe some of you have questions, and I'm I'm willing to just moderate by saying who has questions, and you can direct them to to Navid. Any more questions? So oh, where did you move back to? Like, where is home now? Uh, Salt Lake City, Utah. Which um, it's funny. The first year that we were living in Idaho, a position opened up. My wife's a filmmaker. Um, a position opened up in the film department and I was like, there's no way I'm moving to Salt Lake City, Utah. And then by year three, I was like, let's please move to Salt Lake City, Utah. The position had opened up again. So we've been there for a few years, but I think the process of figuring out where is home is ongoing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes. More, yeah. Sorry. Do you feel more American or more Iranian than as a result of doing the story that you have? sense of sort of examining identity? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm definitely more American. Um, it's funny, I have a friend who moved here from Iran um, like six years ago, and I referred to myself as Iranian, and he laughed at me. He's like, you're not Iranian. He's <laughs> like, fair enough. Um, but I'm definitely more um, American, but I think the process of writing it and then having a daughter has made me uh, sort of reflect on what being um, an Iranian American means uh, what I'm what I can teach my daughter about my parents' culture because I think with every generation you just get farther and farther. Yeah. Right, and it's not a place that we can visit easily. So, yeah. I'll to um, uh, project my own insecurities onto you. I do that constantly, uh, but. Uh, was just curious if you had any thoughts on how to raise a kid without like deeply ingrained identity crises set in for later on in life. <laughs> so the question is, how do you not yeah. instill insecurity? Or like, no. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it's probably a question that any parent could uh, answer, but it is something, thank you so much. Um, it is something that I've I've thought a lot about because I you know I have I have a, a comic for the New Yorker called Learning Farsi Like an American, um, and it's about my own insecurities with Farsi because I'm not fluent. You know I understand everything and I can I joke that I can get by uh, like a first grader with a beard, um, and so there is in some ways I had to I had to I thought about like when wanting my daughter's first language to be farce, which is a whole trip when you're not fluent in the language. Uh, like it did feel like I was trying to fix my own shape by fi fixing Elika. And so that's something that I had to think about because I didn't want to. One, I didn't want her to go through the same thing that I was going through. So I, I wanted her to be able to speak Farsi so she didn't have that shame. But then I also wanted to make sure that I was projecting my own baggage onto her. So all of which is to say, I don't know. <laughs> uh, yeah, but I do, I do say that as part of that comic that I think that there is this, um, Elika means blossoming fruit tree. And so I talk about how thinking about my language and my family's history as being like the branches of an evolutionary tree. And so like, this is a new branch and like it will bud and it will flower and there'll be something new that Elika and I will create together. And I'm never going to be an Iranian and she's never going to be an Iranian, but we'll find that space together, you know, this new identity. Is there any like ritual or any sort of like um, part of the culture that you 
took with you from Idaho? Like, is there anything that you do, any habits that you kind of took from there, possibly for the better, hopefully for the better? Yeah, um, I mean, it's so it's like it's entwined with the land. Um, so like I still try to do gardening. Um, that's one part. But I think for the most part, I think it's just when things get politically really scary, it helps to lean on the relationships that I made that while I was there. Because even the people who I wouldn't agree with on anything, like I did develop, and there were fresh French circumstance, which I don't think limit, like I diminish the friendship, but I do lean on them uh, in trying to understand what the hell is going on in, in America. Sorry, well, I didn't see your hand going. <laughs> That's true. Anyways, um, so how did your parents, uh, you know, obviously they were not too happy that you sidelined them to sure. write this book. Yeah. But once they saw the final result, or I understood that they played some part in helping or your mom did. Like, how, what was their reaction? My mom says I never draw her well. So that's <laughs> the <thing> her <laughs> um, I never get the nose right. And, um, I My dad hasn't read the book yet. Um, my mom, I think she's working her way through it. So I mean, I think more than anything, we're proud. You know, my dad was trying to get me to go to medical school until a few years ago. So I'm hoping that this will finally <laughs> allay. But you see not reading it because... Oh, my dad, my dad's just not a reader. So he said he looked through all the pictures. So which I think is probably, you know, I mean, it's, exactly. So I think that they're 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 proud. Thanks very much. I was very struck by the Virgil quote that you yeah. use as an epigraph and your pro to the prologue. And I just wondered if you could talk a bit about what that particular passage meant to you uh, and when it to you like did you have that in mind when you moved it was it after writing drawing the entire book yeah like I'm a, I'm a classics nerd I studied in undergrad I got I had the privilege of going to Catherine's graduate classics course yesterday felt completely over over my head being in front of you know uh, professionals yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I I think that the as I said earlier like the classics is a way that I I mean I I, I, I turn to them I still enjoy like reading Virgil, I have a tattoo of Catullus on my, uh, on my, on my verse. It says, "I hate and I love." It's very romantic. I never thought I would regret it. I do regret it. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, I think those passages about nature. I mean, I feel like you can't get better than Virgil, and I love that one in particular because it's about like the place. And he says, even if like fame is un, you know, I, I, I forget exactly how it's yeah, translated. Yeah, 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 yeah. I am completely unknown. Have yeah, no exactly. Career. And I feel like there is that. And I think it's ironic in some sense because I'm writing a book about the place and I'm hoping people will read it. So I'm like, I'm seeking, I think this is what all artists do. It's like, please like me. Um, I'm just like Virgil. Like exactly. And, 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 yeah. But I, I, I knew I wanted to, to start the book with something um, that had to do with nature and place and just about nature and Virgil is as good as you. Yeah. It's six o'clock, and so I would like to ask you to join me in um, thanking and. <laughs>